Hello ladies and welcome. Today I'm going to be reviewing the book Primates of Park Avenue, a memoir by Wednesday Martin. I really enjoyed this book. I enjoyed her writing style. The book is very well written, very entertaining. It has a lot of funny parts. The author has a PhD and she has a background in anthropology and primatology which she used to successfully navigate around the group of moms who she referred to as mean girls. So in this book, she talks about her challenges that she had as a new mother as she and her husband moved to the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and she was trying to find her way to make connections and friends, and the most important part of it was making friends with these moms for her son. So I'm going to start reading in the book in chapter two. This chapter two is titled Playdate Pariah. The book has chapter eight chapters and I'll read the contents of the chapters um, before I get into reading chapter two. They are chapter one. Now, I do not speak French, so I always butcher French, but it's come to fault. Chapter two, play date pariah. Chapter three, going native. Mommy wants a Birkin. Chapter four, Manhattan Geisha. Chapter five, a girl's night in. Chapter six, a Xanax and a Bloody Murray. Manhattan moms on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Chapter seven, a rainy day. And then chapter eight, summary field notes. So I'm going to start re reading in chapter two, where she starts to talk about how she finally got her son into nursery school. And from here, she just goes on to talk about some of the challenges that she had with the women and the way that they would treat her. So... Playdate Pariah, Chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading on page 67. My son started nursery school at the height of the boom. There was adrenaline in our blood and hope in the air. People were closing deals. People were buying second and third and fourth homes. Everyone in Manhattan seemed manic with happiness. And every day after dropping my son off at school, I cried, not because it was touching and sweet to watch him cross the threshold of the classroom, not because letting him go was some metaphor for watching him grow up, not because being a mother is poignant and painful sometimes. No, I cried because the other moms were so mean. I called them mean girl moms when describing them to my husband and friends from downtown. They gathered in the hallways in clusters and clicks, heads bowed, murmuring, laughing, whispering. They all seemed to know one another from before. Their uniform telegraphed that they were one tribe united, their identical Burberry raincoats on rainy days, and their cheek puffers on cold days, their crinkly Lenven flats, or the high heels that screamed, I have a driver. They might have lifted their heads from their huddle to return my hello as I walked by, but that almost never happened. I arrived early at school every day to avoid the feeling, that sensation of falling through space I got when they looked right through me. Standing awkwardly on the edge of the group alone, I would usher my son into his room. The second the door opened, say goodbye, and scurry away. Outside on the sidewalk, my arms felt empty and on the worst days my stomach churned because it was unsettling to feel invisible and because, for the life of me, I couldn't get any of these women to agree to make a play date for our children. This I knew. Our children request that we arrange for them to play with someone after school and we arrange it. We arrange it by text or email or phone. I knew the drill from other moms and other schools, 
but my texts, emails, and phone calls to the mothers of my son's classmates went unnervingly unanswered. Even worse, when I followed up in person with the moms in the hallways, they frequently put me off or changed the subject. Sometimes when I asked, they shot alarmed or sly looks at their friends as if to telegraph, oh my God, is she actually doing this? Can you believe how awkward? My son and I, I realized as the other moms continued to look through me every day, were playdate pariahs. I was uncharacteristically distraught. The fate of those female chimps playing in my head, I assessed the playing field. Being shunned was not a pretty picture, nor a fate I wanted for me or my child. The women who were ignoring me seemed nasty and off-putting, yes. I wanted to poke a few of them in the eye, yes. But on some level, I needed them, and I needed to fit in, and my kid needed a play date or two and some friends. Schlepping him downtown was not an option, and anyway, our friends there didn't have his kids his age, or any kids at all in some cases. Spontaneous meetups with new kids at the park or playground up here, just making friends on the spot, sounded like a nice idea. But in a town where kids are hyper-scheduled from drop-off to dropping off to sleep at night, th that was extremely unlikely. Besides, the moms at the playground seemed to regard me as a stalker at worst and someone with poor boundaries at best when I approached in a friendly way. It was clear that on the Upper East Side, moms and toddlers had their pecking order worked out and their places set and their dance cards full long before the wee ones were out of their robies. I was late to the ball and it made me feel desperate. My poor kid and yes, poor me. I didn't want drop off and pick up to feel so bad. I needed to like to be to like and be liked by the moms at school. During this period, I wasn't feeling well physically. I had a spaced out, derealized feeling many days. A sense of being disassociated from my body and the people around me. Describing it to my husband at dinner one night, I re realized it was a clinical condition I had read about before in my studies. I had culture shock, a syndrome of unfamiliarity and alienation that bedevils anthropologists and foreign exchange students and poor kids who get into elite colleges. By this point in my life, I had spent time in many foreign cultures and always found a way in. I had worked briefly at the UN, writing speeches and attending functions with diplomats from all over the world. So I knew I had not entirely inconsiderable social skills. I was well-dressed, relatively speaking, and friendly. What the hell else did these women want from me? Was there something I wasn't doing? Something I was supposed to say? Trying hard to shake off the feeling that I was being judged and found wanting, or that it mattered to me much. I vowed to stop trying to find a way in and simply watch. I was a struggling, insecure mom, but I was also a social researcher, so I'd act like one. Observing was easy, since no one really wanted to speak to me. The first thing I noticed was that outside, the Escalades with drivers were piled three deep and the moms were dressed to kill, though none of them seemed to have jobs. They were on their way to I didn't know where but obviously to them it mattered. Often the most overdressed ones, tipping in their platform boots and sky-high stilettos, will call out, see you there, after dropping their kids at the classroom door. There must be dreadful, I found myself thinking. In the elevator, the rule was more or less total silence. One morning, when I had a meeting and eschewed my jeans and thermal shirt and ponytail for something more fashionable, sleek hair and a bit of makeup, two immaculately groomed women watched, glowering, as I left the elevator. One hissed, who was that? And my hairline prickled. 
The world of the school was turned inside out. It was all about the moms. The moms air kissing and hobnobbing and chit chatting and sometimes backstabbing. The kids in this reordered world were part of a fashionable ensemble, dangling from the impressively toned arms of their mommies like ornaments or accessories. Motherhood, I gathered, was another outfit. And friendliness and chit chat were hoarded, were hoarded, bestowed upon only a few. I also noted that on most mornings, if a mom did deign to speak to me, she gave a curt hello, after which she performatively turned her back and began to speak to someone else. The head of the school's PTA, a woman I had come to think of as the queen of the queen bees, was the first person to do this to me. Mistakenly thinking on one of the first days of school that I was in a world where the rules approximated those of, say, a work environment or friendly cocktail party, I approached her, the parent liaison to the school, after all, and so someone more or less officially representing it, and introduced myself. She looked at me as if, in saying hello and outstretching my hand, I had committed a faux pas like drinking the contents of my finger bowl at a dinner party and then removing all of my clothing. <laughs> How gauche and presumptuous of you to greet me, her sneer and raised eyebrow said. Then she simply turned away without so much as a hello. I was shocked. But eventually I realized this was just an extreme version of what nearly all the women at my son's school did. They conserved their hellos for a select few and expanded just about nothing on most others. This sort of refusal to greet and dramatic back turning most often took place, I realized, when the hoped for interlocturist was a socialite, someone I recognized from the pages of a glossy magazine or the wife of a wealthy man whose name I knew from the newspaper or from my days in advertising. Yes, I figured out pretty quickly these women were not talking to one another so much as they were jockeying for positions to talk to one or two or three particular moms. They had a laser-like focus. It became obvious on what I came to think of as the highest ranking females, those who were, it seemed, richer, prettier, more successful, or most important of all, married to someone more successful than anyone else. Someone who apparently mattered more. Often I call my close friend Lily, the calmest mother and most gracious hostess I knew, whose daughter was my son's age, to tell her the latest, and she would gasp. That can't be true. That they think it's all right to be so awful. She would shout onto the phone and just imagining her as she said it, downtown in the studio where she worked as a fashion designer, reminded me there was a world outside that one I was trying to break into, a world I understood. It was a place where women worked and there were gay couples and straight couples and there wasn't always enough money for every single thing you wanted and not everyone had a car and a driver. I hate them, my friend Candace would say, urging me to act out a shunning scenario from the day before while we had coffee. <laughs> and then she would remind me what writer, Wendy Wasserstein, whose children had gone to the same school mine went to, had said about the experience. So many skinny women, so many gigantic bags. And we would laugh. It helped, but the next day, I still had to go back to the school. I'm going to stop here for a second because that, that line, so many skinny women, so many gigantic bags, reminds me of a section in the book where she talks about how she was walking down the street and she's on the sidewalk. I think she said that she was coming from grabbing something from the grocery store. And she noticed this woman coming toward her. You know how when you're sharing a sidewalk with someone, but you both are, you're, you're headed towards each other and you start to move to the right. 
because you don't want to brush into the person that you're about to pass. And usually they'll start to move a little to their right, just as a courtesy to you as well. So she says in this instance, she's moving to the right, but the other lady's not moving to the right. The other lady is moving to the last left and continued as they were approaching each other to move closer and closer to her. Like she was trying to run her off of the sidewalk on purpose. And like she had this big bag, I think it was like a Birkin bag that she had. And like that was her, I guess, um, like her marker of one upping her. And because she didn't have one, she didn't feel the need to even let her pass on the sidewalk without that type of um, interaction. I just thought that was so crazy. I'm like, it's funny though. The way that she writes about it is so funny. You have to get the book and read it. It was so funny. But then just to think about the way that these women are is just horrible. It really is. I, I, I couldn't do it. So let me finish reading these last two paragraphs. My husband thought it was all ridiculous girl stuff and that I was overreacting. Come on, it can't be that bad, he told me when I shared the details of yet another morning drop-off drama. So I let him do drop-off the very next day. What the hell is wrong with those women, he asked after his first misadventure. They wouldn't even respond when I said good morning. I told you so, I smirked. We marveled that these women had determined that even the most basic and commonly observed tenet of the social contract returning a greeting was for chumps. They were above it. Not long after my husband's experience, our son came home from school one day and excitedly announced that he had been invited to a play date by his friend Tessa on her family's private plane. It was a strange and fanciful invitation, I thought, until our nanny, Sarah, told me that everybody at the school had a private plane and all the kids had been discussing the relative merits of their particular planes when our son said we didn't have one, and Tessa took pity on him and invited him to play on hers. I felt nauseated, but it was a start. He was doing better than I was. <laughs> so it's just really crazy how rude these women are. It's like unbelievable. And I don't know if you've ever experienced any of anyone being so rude to you. If you went to some place that maybe they didn't think that you belonged or just even sometimes if you work for certain companies and you're, you may be from a different department or just, just have you ever seen this or, or heard of such a thing? I have, I have experienced um, people behaving this way. I just, I'm the type of person, I will, if I greet someone, I don't care if this is someone I'm going to see every day, like someone at work, and they can't be bothered to greet me back, I won't say anything else to them. And some of these, some women are just, you know, it's just really terrible the way that they treated her. And I guess they did this to everybody. And it seems like they have the mindset that they don't want to be bothered with anything, anyone who doesn't. Um, who won't benefit them. Like if they don't feel like they can benefit from, from the person for some reason, they don't want to be bothered at all. And I mean, there are a lot of people who are like that. And I actually don't think that there's anything wrong with that. As you get older in life, relationships should be, you know, mutually beneficial. You want to have people in your life who, if you, if you are a woman of value and you have things that you can bring to someone's life. You wanna have friends and and associates who can do the same for you. There's nothing wrong with that. But what usually happens is people aren't so blatant and rude about that. And that's the thing that's so off-putting to me when I read this because that's the exact opposite of proper etiquette to make people feel like an outcast and to embarrass people and to just make people feel bad. And it speaks volumes to I believe the type of people they are, because whenever you see someone who's treating another person bad, they are showing that they don't feel so great about themselves because happy people spread happiness. They want others to feel good about themselves and they want others to be happy too. So I just think that that's just a um, a reflection of who they are and what's really going on in their life. And she does go into some detail in the book and other chapters where she talks about some of the the pressures that these women have to remain skinny and like 
be skinny even when they're pregnant. They can't look pregnant and the cosmetic procedures that they undergo and all of the competition that they go through to get their children in these top um, tier schools and you know the, the husbands who aren't necessarily faithful and the worry about being divorced and the nannies pressures and just all of the pressures that they deal with and she also talks about the alcohol and drug abuse the cosmetic surgery just all of the things that these women go through so I guess they have to have somebody to take it out on and I guess that their way of doing that is just not bothering with any woman who they feel like is beneath them it's really really um just really interesting and there's one part in this book where she she talks about how they went away uh, for the summer to the Hamptons and it's really funny she started taking I think the the gym is called Studio 51 I, I don't I'm not sure I think that's what it's called but it was for yoga and like ballet um type um, workouts aerobics and she talks about how the soul cycle women are like completely different and she called them biker chicks Whereas like the gym that she would attend is more like, I guess, more sophisticated women and the way that she describes them and talks about them is really funny, too. So I'm going to read um, a little bit more. So that you so that you can hear how she actually does end up um, successfully creating some relationships with these women. OK, so I'm going to start. I'll start in the second paragraph here. Lower ranking females obviously want some of the sweet life as well. One strategy they may use to pull themselves up, and she's talking about um, baboons here because remember she's an anthropologist um, with, in a background, or she has a background in anthropology and primatology. So she's talking about um, yeah, chimps and the, their babies and how things work amongst that group. So one strategy they may use to pull themselves up in the baboon society is attempting often repeatedly to groom the alpha females and care for their babies. High ranking females re may rebuff these attempts over and over with swats and slaps and even frequently vicious attacks on the would be babysitters. But eventually, a high-ranking female may allow a lower-ranking one to become what she desperately wishes to be, an aloe mother or an extra caregiver to the alpha's infant or junior offspring for limited periods of time. This gives the lower-ranking female an end, after all. She is increasing the boss lady's fitness by allowing her more opportunities to forage for herself and her baby, unfettered and the prestige of her affiliation with the mom via the child. She is hauling around and tending to can afford her more power and security in the troop over time. Power, powerful olive baboon moms have been power, have the power to empower less powerful ones by proxy. Far from the savannah in the halls of an Upper East Side nursery school during an economic boom, my husband and I were low-ranking primates, and it showed. The kids were all ex extensions of their parents, it seemed, used in bids for upward social mobility. Maybe if we befriend Ari, whose dad is a hedge fund manager, we'll become friends with Ari's mom, we'll tell Ari's dad about my husband's startup, and... Other times, it seemed, these lower-ranking moms just wanted to bask in the glow of the fantastic wealth of others and warm their children there. We were new to the scene, and my husband couldn't really help anyone's career, so we were an unknown quantity, slow to be welcomed. On the Upper East Side, there is a sense that one's child's friends and playmates can set your position in the hierarchy bumping you up or dragging you down. You are only as fabulous as the playdates you procure on behalf of your progeny. And if you don't rate, neither does your cherub. This precarious and anxiety-inducing order of things I was learning turns mothers into powerful gatekeepers and hopeful supplicants. As happens for so many non-human primates who transfer into a troop, I was stuck at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, regarded with suspicion, alternately ignored and harassed. 
How I wish some days that I were a howler monkey. Those young females who immigrate jump to the top spot, pushing more established females down the hierarchy. But no, I was a baboon in this instance. There is no one lower ranking than a new female in a baboon troop. And if she fails to build coalitions with the mid-level and top females, her life circumstances and those of her offspring can be dire. I knew this. If my son and I were ostracized, the status would be hard to shake as long as we stayed here. I didn't want my son to be the kid with no friends at school. I didn't want us, him, to be shunned. So I schemed and smiled in the hallways, even though it was killing me. And in spite of all the hours of observation, I wondered what to do. My salvation was unexpected, but had I remembered my studies better, I might have hoped for or even tried to engineer precisely the circumstances that turned my fate around. It came the same way it does for so many non-human female primates in my predicament, through the attentions of an alpha male. At a class cocktail party hosted by the class mom, I got into a vaguely flirtatious conversation with the father of a boy in my son's class. He was polite, clever, and slightly rakish, unusual among the straight-laced Upper East Side finance guys I was still trying to get used to. He was easy to talk to, and since my husband had stayed home with our son and the moms were busy talking to one another in a clump I had no hope of breaking into, he and I chatted. I later learned he was the scion of some sort of Manhattan banking empire the son of a powerful and wealthy matriarch like Flo, and so very top tier in the school and our class. The next day at drop-off, he suggested in front of a group of mimes that our boys should play. How about this Friday, he asked, and I agreed. How did you do that, one of the friendlier moms asked in a whisper, her eyes wide as he had it off. I've been trying to get him to make a play date for weeks, and he won't. Even though my parents knew his parents when they all lived in Westchester, I shrugged and suggested that next time she might try having a glass of wine with him. From that day forward, the play play date tide turned dramatically. My son had a regular weekly play date with the alpha son, which paved the way for play dates with the kids who were friends with his kids and whose parents, rich and powerful as he was, were friends with him. When these alpha, alpha, when these mothers saw me engage in friendly conversation with Alpha Dad in the hallway, they took note, it seemed. Their body language and newly friendly smiles suggested that they felt I had been vetted and approved. Talking to me, they could now rest assured wasn't necessarily going to pull their own rank down or be a total waste of time. And the more these mothers acknowledged and returned my hellos in the halls, the harder it was for them to ignore my e- emails and play date pleas. When I stood back from it, the play date hierarchy hijinks struck me as strange and unsavory. Their seamy underside was the notion that some parents and some children were more worth it than others. This was repellent but it was also the name of the game. If my son was finally playing with schoolmates and was happy, I was happy. And I felt very indebted indeed to Alpha Dad. Even if Candace and Lily agreed that it was a bad idea to count on him for anything, wasn't he married to one of these unfriendly women? Could he be much better himself? They asked. I wasn't sure. I just knew that in this upside down world, where the parents lived through the kids, it was sort of like being a teenage girl again and having the attentions of the high school football team's star quarterback. His casual friendliness had utterly transformed my son's social life and my rank, which I now realized were unquestionably and inextricably linked. Like Candace and Lily, I didn't trust the state of affairs to last for long, and I was right. Alpha Dad moved on, as alphas do. By that time, though, my son had what he needed, which meant I did, too. 
maybe this wasn't going to be so hard after all. So I'm going to stop reading there and just, um, just, I just really, just really enjoyed this book. And it just made me think of so many things, just like so many, um, videos that I've watched right here on YouTube where women talk about how to, um, how to navigate and how to get into a society like like an upper echelon society and where there are the discussions about class and etiquette and all of these different things. But she did it. She's an example of what she went through. And this woman has a PhD and her husband was well to do. And, you know, she had all of these challenges just because a lot of times not, nothing matters to people but what matters to them if if you get what I'm saying and they just were determined that they were not going to accept her until a certain person as we saw uh, one of the dads of one of the other kids accepted her and was okay with her and then they paid her attention and they wanted to befriend her and her son and that's why I guess it's really good to always have a goal in mind because if she didn't have that goal in mind she probably would have just, you know, a long-term goal. I mean, she probably would have just said, screw this. I'm not putting up with this, whatever. But she had a goal in mind. And there were probably other moms at the school who didn't bother with them, who like me, who probably were like, whatever, I'm not, I'm, that's you. I'm, I'm a person too. You, you're not going to treat me that way, so I'm just not going to pay you any attention. Or there were probably some who just tried and tried and tried and just could not be, would not be acknowledged and they just gave up. But it's just so very important to just make a, a mental note if you are trying to um, break into, I don't want to say break into, but if you're trying to go out into the world and, you know, you want to be a part of a group that's not a group that you grew up in, to understand what's important to those people if you want to make a good impression and even still May I think that maybe if she knew someone, it might have been different for her. Like if she knew someone who was already at the school of, and they could have introduced her. But then again, I guess it would depend on who the someone was that she knew. You know, like it would have to be someone who was important to them for them to even care. So it's just really tricky. And, you know, I can think of, um, you know, times when, I've experienced, you know, like I said before, women who behave like that, but I, I've never, it, it's never hurt my feelings because I really do believe that how you see people treat others is a reflection of them and how they feel about themselves. So it, it's never like where my feelings are hurt and I, I feel worthless and, oh, I've been so rejected because it's just like, I don't really care because I'm just me and I'm, I'm okay with me and I'm happy with me and I don't have a need to be accepted. Now, in the workplace, because that's my career and that's my money, when I deal with people like this, I'm just going to be professional with them. And, you know, that professional friendliness will be there. But that's, you know, I'm good at compart I'm good at putting things in their proper places and boxes and moving on. But when you are trying to do something like this in your personal life, I can just see how difficult this can be. And I know for me, probably the most recent thing that I've experienced like this is um, I started attending a mindfulness group a couple of years ago and most of the people there were much older than me and you know I didn't care because I'm not ageist I'm not sexist I'm not racist so I didn't care that you know everybody there was much older than me and I mean like older than me they were like in their 60s most of them I think and um so there was this one particular woman who pretended that she wanted to be my friend because she really just wanted to um, get in my business but there's no business to tell so then she, she like would keep talking to me about the person who was the facilitator of the group. She would just like keep talking about this man. Now this man is, was married, had been married for a very long time, very nice man, very helpful to me when I had questions and things like that, never made me feel unwelcomed or anything. But this woman, what she did was she would talk to me and then she would take what I said and then she would go back and tell the other women to, and she would, she would add a twist to make it seem like I was a liar or that I was up to no good. And what I realized what she was really doing was she was trying to make it seem as though I was there because I was after this man, which, like I said before, was extremely ridiculous because these people are so much older than me and the man is married. So 
that that's not something that I would do. That's not my character. I would not mess around with anybody's husband because I respect family. And when I say that I respect family, that doesn't just stop with me respecting my own family. I would not go and be concerning myself with another woman's husband like that because that's just not who I am. But this woman, yeah, she was crazy. She was like, and I really do believe that she's a total racist too or prejudiced at, at, at best. Um, and the last time that I saw her, it was so crazy because there's another woman there who, who I did be genuinely, you know, we gen, genuinely have a, you know, a, maybe it'll bloom into a friendship. But like I said, I've known these people for a couple of years now, but there was a big event and um, I went and at this event, everyone kind of dressed up and everything. So me and the other woman who, who I'm really cool with are walking and she's entered she's introduced me to her daughter who's my age and everything and then this other crazy woman just runs up to me and she's she's like you look so confident and professional you're making me jealous that's exactly what she said like she just ran up to me and me and the other woman were just standing there looking at her like really and I just looked at her and I just I didn't say anything I just looked at her and I just like kind of smiled like really like you really have some mental health issues that you need to get um third lady because you're like making a scene making yourself look really stupid right now and you know I could have said to her well what am I supposed to look like or I could have said to her you're being rude or you know I could have said a lot of things to her but I didn't say anything to her because sometimes silence is the best response that you can give an ignorant person like that but you know later on she ended up um confessing to me which is I already knew was was going on in the email that she had feelings for this guy she was married to both of them had been married for a very long time so she confesses to me that she had feelings for him that she was working through and it's like duh I knew that because you kept talking about the man all the time for no reason at all but to deflect what she was feeling, she thought she was going to push it all off on me to make it look like it was me when it was really her the whole time who wanted to get down with that man. Yeah. So just watch out for people like that, ladies. You know, when you go into, um, you know, a go amongst these women, just always know that you won't always be welcome and they will try to, you know, be sneaky and destroy your reputation, especially if they feel like you're some type of threat to them. If you're a single woman and you're going there and they'll assume that you're looking for a man when really you may just have an interest in whatever is going on there. They'll think that, you know, even though really that's not, that wasn't any of her business. You know, if this man did have a wife and a girlfriend, it wasn't any of her damn business. That was between him and his wife. If he did, you know, that's not her business. So so it's just, you know, when people try to do stuff like that, just always be, you be the classy one. You be the one to just look at them. And especially when you're a woman of a certain phenotype, they already expect you to act a certain way because they, you know, buy into a lot of stereotypes often thinking that you are going to be a certain way so that they can point the finger at you and say, look, look, look. And like with this woman, you know, um, who the author of this book, if she would have jumped out of her skin and, you know, said something to them and been very direct, like, you know, you're being really rude to me. They would have found a way to turn it on her and be like, oh, see, she's not one of us. She's not one of us. And they would have just found more ways to ignore and reject her. So she, she was classy in her approach as well. Um, and how she handled this whole situation. And I was glad to read the book to see how things turned out for her. But just, you know, know that when you try to go into and navigate into some of these groups, that things won't always be easy. I don't think anyone really thinks they're easy unless you're naive. But um, just know that, yeah, people will always be there. there will always be some kind of gatekeeper, even though that person may just be unofficial, you know, a busybody that likes to stir up trouble. And that's why I make it my business to stay away from people who make other people's business their hobby. So with that being said, I hope that you enjoyed my review of this book. Again, it is Primates of Park Avenue, a memoir by Wednesday Martin, and I definitely recommend the book. It's not a very long read, and it's just a really good book, plenty of humor, and she just wrote this book so well. I really enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoyed this review. Please like and subscribe.